I'm Patricia, and this is Investigating Vegan Life with Patricia Kathleen. This series features interviews and conversations I conduct with experts from food and fashion to tech and agriculture, from medicine and science to health and humanitarian arenas. Our inquiry is an effort to examine the variety of industries and lifestyle tenants in the world of vegan life. To that end, we will cover topics that have revealed themselves as common and integral when exploring veganism. The dialogue captured here is part of our ongoing effort to host transparent and honest rhetoric for those of you who, like myself, find great value in hearing the expertise and opinions of individuals who have dedicated their work and lives to their ideals. You can find information about myself and my podcast at patriciakathleen.com. Welcome to Investigating Vegan Life. Now let's start the conversation. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. This is your host, Patricia, and today I am excited to be sitting down with Kathleen Kastner. She is an entrepreneur, business owner, author, and vegan cooking show host. Welcome, Kathleen. Thank you so much for having me, Patricia. Absolutely. I'm so excited. You have such an amazing um, history and a dynamic professional life, and I want to get into all of that. I'm going to read, for everyone listening, I'm going to read a brief bio on Kathleen, but before I do that, a quick roadmap um, so you can follow today's podcast and its trajectory. We're going to get into Kathleen's background, um, mainly her, her vegan story and how she can kind of enumerate where she came to be at this point in her life. And then we'll turn to unpacking her professional past and the dialogue um, that that has between what she was doing with that and the vegan world. And then we'll turn to the ethos of her current work um, with the Humane Society and the Food Forward Program. And then we'll turn um, our attention towards the end of the podcast towards future goals, both professionally and personally, as well as any advice Kathleen might have for those looking to get involved in any of the projects that she's had or maybe emulate some of her career's success. A quick bio on Kathleen before I start peppering her with questions. Kathleen Kessner has a master's degree in exercise physiology and has been a vegan since 2002. She works for the Humane Society of the United States with their Food Forward Program, for, sorry, the Forward Food Program as a food nutrition coordinator. She leads plant-based culinary trainings at schools, colleges, and hospitals to help institutions get more vegan food on their menus. Her mission is to educate people on the health benefits of whole food, plant-based diet while saving animals and helping the planet. Kathleen was a yoga studio owner in Kansas City for 16 years and teaches Ashtanga Yoga Retreats internationally. She's the author of Yoga's Path to Weight Loss and hosts a vegan cooking show on YouTube. So you can find out a little bit more. She's got a couple of websites, www.kathleenkastner.com. That's K-A-T-H-L-E-E-N-K-A-S-T-N-E-R.com and www.foodforward.org. We can, um, as we discussed that, you might want to hit that website. So Kathleen, before I get into everything that you are currently doing with um, Food Forward and the Humane Society, I'm hoping you can draw us like, a roadmap of what you feel like your personal story or background in history, education, all that stuff has been with your vegan life. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Well, I was born and raised in Kansas, which I like to joke that it's not exactly the vegan capital of America. (laughs) (laughs) I was really fortunate that I, from Kansas, when I got out of college, I moved to San Diego and got a job with Sharps Hospital. And one of my first clients there was Dr. Deepak Chopra. So I'm, wow. I'm this young, naive girl, and this would have been in 1993, and I get to meet Dr. Chopra at my job. And I didn't know who he was at the time, but I became, became his personal trainer and got introduced to his work and consciousness and got introduced to my first yoga class, which literally changed every single aspect of my life for the better. So I'm really grateful that for that divine synchronicity, I had to be at that job at 5 a.m. in the morning, right after college, and that I would get to meet Deepak. So I definitely, looking back, you know, 25 years later, realized it was definitely meant to be. So I got introduced to yoga, and through the years, I changed everything. My diet was the first thing to change. I was already vegetarian 
uh, I think unfortunately I might've been eating like a fish a couple times a year and I had to put my cat to sleep. I had a 22 year old cat, my childhood cat, and I chose to hold her while they did it. And it really like woke me up. I was like, I am, I don't ever need to eat any living being again. You know, I really got it. And I felt like that was a gift she gave to me. And so I became vegetarian, started practicing yoga daily, got to open my first yoga studio in 1999 in Kansas City. And every year I did yoga, something dropped that wasn't serving my highest good. You know, I eventually dropped, I dropped alcohol, I dropped caffeine, which I thought I would never live to say <laughs> in my whole life. But I, but I was still having some health problems. I was having a lot of allergies, asthma, and acne. And it was from the dairy, but I had no idea. Hmm. So I went to a conference, Marianne Williamson hosted this conference, and I went from Kansas City to Michigan. She was the minister of a church and hosted this big peace conference, and one of her speakers was Congressman Dennis Kucinich from Ohio, and he stood up on that stage saying how he had had these undiagnosed health problems and no one could figure out what was wrong with him. And he read Diet for a New America by John Robbins. And John Robbins was the heir to Baskin Robbins mm -hmm. <laughs> and chose to not take over the family business because he saw his uncle died early in his early 50s of a heart attack. His father got diabetes and he realized that the dairy was killing his family members. Mm -hmm. So he did not take over the business, which was a huge falling out and became this amazing plant-based educator. So he wrote this book, Diet for a New America, and Dennis Kucinich had read it and told the whole audience how he changed to a plant-based diet and those undiagnosed health problems magically went away. So I was sitting in the audience going, well, my gosh, I'd never even considered, you know, I wasn't even eating a lot of dairy and eggs. I was actually more of an Italian dressing than a ranch dressing kind of person. My whole life I had been like that, but the little dairy that I would have was really wreaking havoc on my health. So I remember sitting in the audience thinking, well, I'm already vegetarian, you know, and I don't even know if he said the word vegan, but I went back to Kansas City where I didn't know any vegans and I just took them out of my diet. And it was like a miracle. My skin cleared up practically in the first week. Um, I got off the inhaler, I got off the Plonase and my whole, my health changed. So that's my vegan story. Mm -hmm. And then when I did learn the ethics of what was going on in the dairy industry and in the egg industry, and that we were impregnating cows and taking away their babies and grinding up male chicks and grinders. And I was like, there is no way I'm going to have anything to do with these systems that are being cruel to animals. So I it was very easy for me. I, I it's been 18 years and I just, I never looked back. It was just like a switch went on and it was very easy. I, my husband I met 12 years ago was miraculously vegan. We had a vegan wedding yes. <laughs> to our Kansas and Wisconsin family members <laughs> in Los Angeles. And so it's just been a huge part of my life. I'm really blessed that I have a partner who's supportive and he's a great cook and our yoga studio in Kansas City, we promoted veganism as much as possible. Yeah, I wonder with your, so given this prolific history that you have with um, a, a yoga studio, and you and I spoke just uh, briefly off the record before we started the podcast about how um, yoga studios are kind of tricky. And when I run into them, I interview a lot of, of small business owners and even um, all the way up to large business titans. And sometimes the industry can confuse one to thinking that it's not a business type industry. And we talked about how yoga studios are one of those areas where I, I find that people assume like, you know, yogis own them and they do a lot of yoga, but it, it is indeed a business unto itself. And I was wondering um, the connection between as a business owner, you know, and a yogi yourself, there is an inherent connection. I find a lot of um, yoga yogis or people who do yoga are not as shocked to find someone being vegan, but there's also an assumption that every yogi is vegan or that they understand that lifestyle. And I'm wondering throughout, because you had such a prolific career owning different yoga studios, I'm wondering if you ever had an opportunity 
to engage in collaborations or education regarding veganism? Or did you keep those things very separate? You were a vegan. You were also a yoga studio owner. Did they ever collaborate? Uh, yes, I pretty much shouted it from the mountaintop <laughs> once I once I knew knew better for myself that how it could help you know not only my health but the animals and the environment yes i became very outspoken and i did get some grief and i probably still do but i'm i'm going to keep speaking it <laughs> i um got these vegan startup kits from PETA. they will give them to you for free they will ship them to your yoga studio for free they have a benefactor who pays for them and I sat them right up there at the front desk with all the other literature schedules. Um, our ho when we hosted teacher trainings, I would ask our students to go vegan. Of course, they had free will, whether they did or didn't. But we have had people come back later through the years who have stayed vegan. And we would host vegan potlucks and movie screenings and just tried to really get them involved, you know, of course, most of them were not vegan, but if you share delicious vegan food and then people can realize like, hey, I don't have to be deprived. This is amazing. So we did them at our home. We did them at the studio. And I always think that sharing delicious food is a great people, great way to help educate people on the benefits of veganism. Yeah, it's that's it's clever too. I hadn't I hadn't put those together. I mean, there are religions out there that put service and food in a way to you know help convert and share a peaceful message. Um, and so it, it it stands to reason that a, a dietary and, and lifestyle movement could easily do the same. Um, I think that's a really good point. And um, always through education, right? Just sharing that education. Yes. Um, so I'm wondering, I want to turn now the efforts towards um, looking at the ethos of the Humane Society and the Food Forward Program. Can you start by painting a picture um, of what, the, when I think of the Humane Society, I tend to think of um, animals and, and things of that nature. And so um, I want to look at, can you explain um, what aspect of the Humane Society, what chapter, that type of thing that you're in, and then ex also draw us out of uh, uh, like an outline of what the Food Forward program is. Sure, sure. So I work for the Humane Society of the United States, and I just want to clarify, it's Forward Food. Oh, forward sorry. Food. I That's okay. <laughs> it's forwardfood.org, and it was started four years ago and by Chef Wanda, and it is under meat reduction. So this is farm animal protection and meat reduction, these cam campaigns it's under. So we're trying to save farm animals in a nutshell by teaching people how to make delicious plant-based foods without using them. And we're, we're not asking people to go vegan, but we're just asking to get more plant-based options on institution menus for, for those who care to have them especially when somebody's in the hospital, if they went in for heart disease, you know, the last thing we want to do is give them bacon and eggs in the morning after they wake up from yeah. their heart surgery. And I've worked in cardiac rehab when I was younger. So it's very important to educate them right away, you know, and of course people have free will, but if we can at least start introducing healthier foods. So at the Humane Society, we do these plant-based culinary trainings to K through 12 food service workers dietitians, chefs, colleges, and hospitals. So it's a lot of fun. So we go in and we work with the staff. Sometimes it's around 20 people. And I give a PowerPoint on why we're there for health, animals, the environment. And then we get to go into the kitchen. And it depends on the institution, but sometimes I get to bring one of our vegan chefs from Seattle and work with their culinary staff to make anywhere from 15 to 20 plant-based recipes. So we break them up into teams of two and they get recipes and they make them within a couple hours. And then when it's done, we set up a big buffet table and the whole staff gets to taste all the different dishes. They present their dishes. They, they are allowed to make tweaks if they want to make the recipe their own. It just, can't have animal products, <laughs> but extra spice here and there. And so we really try to get the staff excited about plant-based foods so that they'll be more interested in helping to make them. So then the food service director and the chefs get to decide which recipes they'd like to put on their menus. 
And then I follow up with them within the next few months to see what changes they've made in meat reduction. That's exciting. I think it's such a great way to come at it. You know, um, it's, it's this kind of, again, this educational model of, of showing and educating as, as you kind of set up um, some of the dangers of, of having meat so prolifically um, represented in the American diet, even on the social level. I'm wondering, um, with schools, have you been able, when you get into colleges, have you, has the program looked into getting into elementary schools? And if you have done that, is that, that's a system that I think even um, a lot of people, I, I have children that go to school and I'm not sure if it's state mandated or federally mandated, you know, how that school lunch system works because my children don't partake in it. But I'm wondering how much flexibility there is to have organizations such as Forward Food go in and pitch them and speak to them. Is it state run? Are you guys able to penetrate some of the areas near what you're doing or is it mainly on the college level? Yo, we definitely do K through 12. It's a lot of fun. I've gotten to, to do, I've only had the position for eight months, but I've gotten to do some K through 12s and they do make changes. They like our, our vegan sloppy joes that are made with lentils and veggie crumbles and barbecue sauce. Yes, we definitely, we have all the nutritional requirements that are necessary to meet their um, requirements. And then, so our meat alternative is usually beans or lentils in that respect. So as long as it meets the requirements nutritional wise for the meat requirement and the protein requirement, then it's, it's good to go and they can adopt them. That's fantastic. I think it's so exciting to have those, those because as you introduce the younger generation to it, I think that's where you, you truly get you know, early education and experience with that education coming up. Um, and I think programs like that need to start taking hold. I mean, the, the food paradigm that they developed the nutritional guidelines from is suspect, you know, anyway, it hasn't really been overturned and people who have have just kind of flipped it on its head. But um, I do think that looking into systems like this, the, one of the biggest problems people think is that developing a solution would be um, very, very difficult. Do you have specific products that are kind of your um, go-to? You mentioned the lentils for Sloppy Joes for the schools and things like that. Do you, does your program have these kind of staples, if you will, of, of um, supplements that you bring in quite frequently to kind of pitch people on? We actually give them a grocery list with all the ingredients for all the different recipes. So if there's 20 recipes, the chef helps and I help design this list so they go shopping. And sometimes they do need a little help, you know, like mm -hmm. where do I get nutritional yeast? Or if they need a certain brand of veggie crumbles or chicken nuggets, like we refer them out to Hungry Planet or Morningstar, or we connect them with vendors. We don't have our, our own vendors, you know, that we that we use exactly, we give them options so they can source it from any plant-based company they'd like. Or sometimes I just try to give them a little guidance on where to go if they don't know how to get vegan mayonnaise. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. It's great because it removes you guys from affiliation and, and getting yes. you know caught up with um, it being more corporate-based which I think there has been kind of a movement towards, there's been, <clears throat> and now I'd like to kind of crawl into that. So there's plant-based and there's vegan. And I've been interviewing um, a lot of people involved in the vegan world. So not just the food world um, that you're functioning in, but also the community, artistic, you know, endeavors, fashion designers, cosmetic creators. Um, and this idea has kind of arisen and a lot of people feel like it's starting as it always is, starting to get become an advertising debate, but you have plant-based and then you have vegan. And I'm wondering, um, everyone defines these a little bit differently. So I'm hoping that just to get an idea from you and your perspective, how would you define something that is plant-based um, and how would you define something as vegan? Is there a difference? What is the difference for you in your work? For me, because vegan was around, when I became vegan, vegan was the term. So I, I associate with the word vegan. I also, for me, vegan means that I also care about the animals and the ethics and the spirituality and, and Mother Earth, because it's Earth Day. And I feel like when this whole food plant-based movement came out, which is great, because that means usually very little or no oil or sugar or salt, 
usually for people who are having serious health problems, you know, diabetes, heart disease, weight loss, or high blood pressure, high cholesterol. So this whole food plant-based diet came out, which is the healthiest way to eat because there's a lot of vegan junk food, you know, I mean, potato yeah. chips, Oreos, pot and soda. So it is important to eat a whole food plant-based diet and then, you know, have a little fun on the weekend. Maybe <laughs> have some sweet potato fries out or something like that. But for me, I identify with the word vegan because I am such an animal advocate and sometimes plant-based people are not as interested in the animals and the environment. They're very, very into health, which is wonderful. And we need all angles to support the movement. For, but for me, that is the big difference that when you're vegan, you're really, you're in it for all, all reasons. And when you're just plant-based, you're really mainly into it for your health. Yeah. Which, which again is great. <laughs> and sometimes I've seen that the whole food plant-based people become animal advocates and environmental activists, you know, becomes more to them. And I'm the same way. I mean, when I went vegan, I had no idea what was going on with the cow, dairy cows and the egg industry. So I started for my health too. Yeah, I think, and it, you're right. I th I've seen a lot of gateway moments like that, you know, a gateway drug. Um, and there's a lot of different reasons. You know, I've interviewed people that came at being coming. Um, they're unlike, I call them the unlikely vegans because they don't have a history or um, an environment that would create veganism, but they suffered a heart attack at 35 and thought, forget it. And there's just, there's a lot of different ways. Some people have watched Game Changers and decided I can't, I can't be a part of this. There's been a lot of avenues now with the pandemic. Um, I've spoken to a bunch of people recently that are investigating the lifestyle heavily because um, it's, you know, health has become at the forefront of everyone's mind. Um, and the plant-based versus vegan, I think there, there's been a lot of pushback that I've heard about, particularly in the um, food industries, because plant-based is being attached by marketing agendas that also have animal products in them. And so when vegans identify with being plant-based, they're consuming or buying things and, and discovering that they're not vegan. It's kind of like being fortified with, you know, um, vitamin D or other like folic acid, you know, when they, when health people got a hold of that in the eighties and nineties, everything was suddenly fortified and terrifying. Yeah. And they'll yes, do you're right. They to do. There, there are plant-based, they'll say plant-based products and they'll have a little egg or casein. Yeah. <laughs> if you read the ingredients. Right. So you do, if, you, if, you, if, you're, if you're serious about it, just read the ingredients. Absolutely. Um, and so I want to kind of turn towards, uh, I'm not sure how much rhetoric you have had on a professional level or personal level. I did touch briefly on, you know, the interest and the return to thinking about health um, as, as, a, as a civilization is kind of peaking for people. And I'm wondering if you've thought, um, if there's been enough time for you to kind of marinate in it and think about how um, the Humane Society or Forward Food would sculpt. Do you think that you, some of your rhetoric will start changing to be more inclusive of talking about the pandemic as, as restrictions rise, of course, and you return back to, I know you have this kind of in-person format to a lot of what you do. Um, and as that returns, do you think that some of the dialogue will change to kind of include what we have um, been experiencing as a society? Definitely. I, I was talking with my manager. We're hoping to be able to, we do this PowerPoint and at least, you know, add in a slide or two about what's happened. We really try to focus on health, the health and the environment. And so, but, so, and both of those things are relative to the pandemic. Yeah. And the thing is that all slaughterhouses are, are, you know, breeding grounds for disease. I mean, there's, We've already had avian flu, bird flu, swine flu. There's a lot. There's mad cow disease that is very covered up in the United States. There's salmonella, E. coli, Ebola, SARS. I mean, the list goes on and on about it. Is it isn't just happening in other countries? It's happening in the United States. So that raising animals for food is a, is a breeding ground for disease. So we are going to hopefully we we definitely won't be dwelling on it, but we we're, we'll plug it in there a little bit. <laughs> Absolutely, at least to stay current, right? I'm yes. wondering, um, I, I want to really quickly circle back. I neglected to ask you, I'm interested in people who come up with these recipes that you have. You mentioned um, a chef in Seattle. If, if, we, if we get to, you like to fly someone down. Where do you find your chefs? How do you collect the recipes? Do you ever have competitions that people can kind of submit to? Or how does that work? 
You know, it's all done internally within Ford Food and HSUS. So we have a staff of amazing chefs and they are recipe creators and they also will collaborate with like Sodexo, large food management companies and create plant-based recipes that are just proprietary just to that institution though. So if it's, if it's a Sodexo college, then we have these Sodexo recipes. But then anybody can go to forwardfood.org under food service, and there are about 100 plant-based recipes for anyone. Just be sure you look at the top of the serving size because we are doing larger institutions, you know, 10 to, 10 to 12 servings, and you could just cut it in half or less. Yeah, so we have, they're very creative, and they're always updating them to make them even better because yeah, that's just really... For me, even before I had this job, which is why I started my YouTube channel, my number one way to help animals is by teaching people how to cook without using them. Yeah. Because everybody loves good food. Not everybody is passionate about their health or the animals and the environment. I wish they were. <laughs> but everybody likes good food. So that's what we try to do with forward food. We just try to make great food. In fact, we encourage like K through 12, if they're gonna add one of our recipes, research shows to not call it vegetarian or vegan, to not mm -hmm. say, this is a vegan sloppy joe today, you know? <laughs> to right. use creative adjectives like, you know, spicy, spicy bean chili or, you know, something really, more descriptive that doesn't just saying this is a veggie burger you know black bean sweet potato burger or just something so the kids aren't like oh yeah <laughs> well and likewise i like to tell people they've been substituting your meat with soy for years now so don't yeah. worry about it this kind of like trade-off yeah. has been going down yeah. for a while and i feel kind of bad for those children who are very conscious and gandhi like from birth who actually are looking for the v word <laughs> but um because they've probably grown up with it or have educated themselves that they they understand what it is without being called that yeah and so yeah so it just it just helps if you just use a fun descriptive word like this food service director told me they were doing a three bean chili on fritos which i know aren't the most amazing exactly <laughs> healthy food but they called it a frito boat and yeah. the kids love the frito boats so yeah it didn't help to say anything about it being meatless exactly it was a frito boat. Uh -huh. so likewise so you bring your chefs in internally they're brought in by the humane society if what if someone had a school system or something that they wanted you to pitch to could they reach out to you or your department and yeah, have you I cover the Southwest region, but we have coordinators throughout the country. So if it's not in, I, I do California, Arizona, Utah, New Mexico, Colorado, Arizona. So, and then we have others, other coordinators around the country. So yes, please reach out to me and I'll connect you with the right people. That's exciting. Well, I want to climb into the um, before we before I let you go. I want to climb into um, your YouTube cooking channel and all of that. How um, how long have you been doing it? How long are the episodes? Where can people find your channel? Sure, if, on YouTube, it's actually under my name, Kathleen Kastner. I call it Vegan Vitality, but you can find it under Kathleen Kastner. So when I I left Kansas City five years ago. I sold my yoga studio, which was a big deal because I'd had it for 16 years. And I really wanted to dive into wellness and vegan education. So the ironic thing is, I, I was not a very good cook. <laughs> my husband's the better cook. Yeah. But I'm not even sure. We started like on Facebook Live and I just kept telling him like, I just feel like we have the greatest chance to help people if we show them what we eat. You know, we're, I'm from Kansas again, and he's from Wisconsin. I'm like, we think everyone knows what we eat as vegans, but they probably really don't know. So let's show them some of this awesome food we make. So yeah. he started filming me, and he's in a few of them too, because again, he's actually the better cook. But we started filming them in my kitchen, and it's just been a lot of fun. We have since moved. We have a better kitchen now, <laughs> and we have upgraded our equipment. So I feel like we're just kind of finally starting over. But it's been great to share delicious recipes 
And I love hearing the feedback when people start telling me they're making pineapple fried rice weekly for their families and that the kids like that, you know, so that makes me excited. We, we have a long way to go. So I would really appreciate it if anybody subscribed because I really want to reach more and more people in 2020 and share delicious vegan brands that I do use, such as Simple Truth Organic, which is a Kroger brand and very affordable and easily accessible. So it's just been a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Especially with, you know, the um, a friend reached out to me, a colleague, and she called it COVID cooking, but, you know, people swapping recipes and channels and getting into things even for those who aren't, um, you know, vegan or vegan identified to look at some of your recipes and try them out. Like that's, it's an exciting change. And, you know, people have some time right now to maybe get to it and everyone's cooking at home. So it's a great time. We call it quarantine cooking and we have about (laughs) 90 recipes on there. We, We literally have made every single favorite dish we have. I'm still, I'm researching weekly, trying to come up with more, yeah. more and more. So as we, every- yeah, absolutely. As we wrap up today, I'm wondering, um, I know that things have changed because of the current climate with everyone's, um, and the precariousness of where everyone's headed professionally and things like that. And so if you haven't had a, a recent dialogue with yourself, perhaps before, um, the COVID-19 hit, but can you uh, elaborate a little bit about your future goals, both dealing with the Humane Society and Forward Food, as well as like the cooking channel? Where do you see yourself kind of wanting to head or some of your goals for the next one to three years? Okay, that's a great question. Well, with the Humane Society, we really are working towards helping institutions to go 50% plant-based in the next four years. Nice. Which is already happening, amazingly. So that's my goal with the Humane Society. And to be honest with you, my goal with my cooking channel is I would love, I would love, I'll just throw it out there. I'll make it a big goal. Yeah. (laughs) I would love to have a million subscribers and I would love to have Simple Truth Organic be our sponsor. Great. Well, there you go. You know, it's, it's, it's the secret, right? This is a visual or verbal vision board. Absolutely. That's, that's a great goal. I love it. A million subscribers and simple truth organic. That's fantastic. Um, well, we are all out of time today, but I wanted to tell you that I really appreciate everything that you've kind of Kathleen, everything that you've enumerated on. Um, I love the work that you're doing and, um, and I really appreciate uh, all of the information you gave us. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share veganism with your audience. Absolutely. And for everyone listening, we've been talking with Kathleen Kastner. You can find her at KathleenKastner.com and you can also find out more about what she's doing to Humane Society at ForwardFood.org. Um, and until we speak again next time, Thank you for giving us your time and remember to eat clean, eat well, and always bet on yourself. Stay safe. Sláinte.